Hello everyone, my name is Sigadi Payani Shahani and I am the CEO of the South African Institution of Civil Engineering. Welcome to our second installment of our CEO's podcast. Today I am joined by Sindra Naika from Nyeleti Consulting Engineers. We're going to have a very um, beautiful conversation around inclusive leadership and how we can use it to foster collaboration and ensure that we create cultures where people feel valued and respected. Welcome, Sindri. Thank you so much for joining me today in the second installment of our podcast. Thank you for inviting me, Sakani. I think I appreciate it. Like I said, I'm looking forward to the conversation. We don't have enough of these conversations. Exactly. So it's good that we can have it. So, yeah. so tell me more about you um, and your role here at Nyeleti, how you're also affiliated with SAISI in the past or currently. So my role, you know, you talk about mentorship and grooming and inclusivity. I uh, as a young engineer, when I joined Nileti more than 20 years ago, mm. uh, my former CEO and mentor at that stage, which was Pine, you know. Yes, I know Pine very well, yeah. He pushed me to be part of volunteerism, part mm. of, uh, you know, either IC or CISA, mm. one of these organizations. So, um, I'm currently the CEO of Nileti, but historically, through my engagements with uh, SIC and my involvement, I am the past president of SIC, I think it was, 2017, yeah, about, I'm not sure. Wow, how old were uh, you then? I think I was 48, 47. So one of the youngest presidents of SAISI, I'm sure. I think one of the youngest guys, yeah. 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 Uh, before that, I was chairperson of the transportation division, so I have come through the ranks. Um, not so involved recently, I think running the business has taken a lot of mm -hmm. pressure, taking its toll. Mm -hmm. But I definitely said to the guys that it's something that as I get into this management role and things settle down to be more involved with the industry. So. Mm. No, thank you very much. So, um, do you think that um, when we look at this topic of inclusive leadership, uh, do you think that this proactively encouraging inclusive leadership will have like long-term benefits on the industry? Yeah, it has to. I, I think there's, there's, there's obviously a, a, gen, a new generation of people that's mm. out there. And, and they want to be part of the processes and the decision making and you know they, they don't just want to be told what to do. So I think if you want to foster growth in the environment and you encourage people to stay and you want to retain talent, yeah. you need to be inclusive. But I think diversity is just as important. You know, I, I, you need to understand people's backgrounds, where they come from, what's their influencing factors. You know, some of the guys parents are engineers, mm. so it's a natural fit. Mm. They get in here and it's a, you run. Some people are first generation educated. You know, their parents, like my dad, for example, worked in a shoe factory. Some parents are, are helpers in the home or drivers or whatever. So for them, this whole thing is new. Investment, engineering, professionalism, the simple environment. So you've got to understand the diversity yeah, yeah. and the inclusivity. So both of them are important. I think proactive, look, I think everybody's proactive in our industry. I mean, as a board, as a company, you're required to be proactive put strategy in place to mitigate risks and all those things. So the key words are inclusivity and diversity. Yeah. So when Nyeleti was formed in 1999, about 25 years ago, um, I mean, that was a, quite an audacious move, you know, and you were quite bold in your statement that you are um, after excellence and also, you know, promoting diversity. Tell me about that Nyeleti story and how you've incorporated those elements in your growth up until today. So Nyeleti was founded by a Pine, uh, the former CEO in Stanford, who was um, one of the few actually professionally engineered, uh, black engineers at that point in time. And I think it was founded on the basis of uh, transformation. Mm. Um, I think when we started the transformation journey, we very quickly changed to excellence. Yeah. And I think uh, sometimes we get so lost in the term transformation that we forget about excellence. The young people of today don't want to be a transformational appointment. They don't want to be there because of the color of their skin or you know the length of the hair or whatever the case may be. They want to be there because they deserve to be there from exactly. an excellence perspective. And I say this often. We're a transformational company. I think 70% of our staff are, are, are non-white. Um, I think half of them are ladies. So from a ladies perspective, from a, a affirmative action, we tick all those boxes. But that's not it. We are technically excellent. That's what we sell. And I think that's an important message to get across. It's not just all about transformation. I love that. I absolutely love that because you don't want to have that stigma 
um, when you are a non-white engineer within this industry and this unconscious bias that actually follows you everywhere you go in terms of your ability to be able to produce, you know. So let me not talk the talk, right? I think yeah. if you're doing this podcast, do a video of the office. Go and look at my technical team and you will see what I, it, it's there. Um, and I think that's an important picture to say. It's, it's one thing to talk about it, but we're proud of the fact that we've got so many female engineers in this company. And we support them through, you know, I mean, if you t- talk about com- uh, labor relations, uh, we support our ladies. We pay during maternity leave, it's not a requirement. We pay our staff. We encourage them to work if they want mm-hmm. to during this process. Mm-hmm. So we create a positive environment for our staff. That is awesome. I wanted to know how you balance efficiency versus equity, you know, um, and how you also take, for instance, like when a woman needs to go on maternity leave, um, but there's also like project deadlines which you need to meet. Um, how, how do you navigate those kind of scenarios within like Nileti? Yeah, we don't balance equity and excellence, right? <laughs> I think there's not a balance. We balance and we focus on excellence. Okay. Um, you know, I think. When we employ, obviously the country has an Employment Equity Act. We've got to subscribe to that and we do. But uh, there's not a balance to strike. Excellence is required at all, all points in time. When it comes to maternity leave and people going on leave, or, you know, and I think it's slightly different for men and women, uh, when ladies have to take time off to see to, to, to their families, uh, we, we make provision for that and we make allowance for that and we encourage it. And we've got our succession planning is such that we can afford for one key person to step out for a while. I love that. Um, so the idea is we create an environment of collaboration yeah. and support so that people can come in. You know, some of the people, even when they're on maternity leave, we've had it now with our uh, financial manager who's a female. She worked through her entire maternity leave. She would send emails when the child was sleeping at 2 in the morning, I would get the email. So. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think all finance people are like that because our CFO is also typically like that. Um, so, I, I, how do you how do you think that leaders can really um, leverage this diverse business culture? And um, what strategies have worked for you personally um, as a leader to be able to, and which are part of your core leadership approach in terms of your values and the like? So, the strategy is not a difficult thing. I think. In all our strategies, we have this thing that we need to be more inclusive, we need to be more diverse. I think the question is, is, is what is the traction on that? You know, it's fine to have a strategy, but how do you give traction to that strategy? What are your goals? What are your projects? What are your action plans that you are putting in place to be diverse and inclusive? And I think in our case, obviously, that entire thing stemming from the strategy needs to be fostered by your culture, your vision statement, all of that. So everything. It's, it's a holistic approach. It's not just a strategy, it's your culture, your vision, your mission statement, your strategy, and then how do you unpack it? So you need to be, be able to enforce these things. So you need to put policies in place. You know, like I said, whether it's maternity leave policies uh, or um, committees, part of the policies is have committees to discuss remuneration, for example. Um, our employment equity committee, for example, it needs to be a diverse group of yeah. people, young, old, white, black. Um, so those things are more important than, than the strategy. Mm. It's, it's how to enforce the strategy. And I, I think we're doing that because what we're trying to do is, is in, encourage uh, talent and create talent retention. And you need to let the younger team know that they're part of the process. Mm. Uh, it's not all roses. It's difficult to navigate these things. You know, I'm a little bit older, you can see from the gray. <laughs> yeah? So I'm, I'm also constantly learning from the younger people, which is incredible. Mm-hmm. I, I take my lead from a lot of the younger guys in the office. I want you to pan back to your time when you were leading our voluntary association, um, especially like SAISI. I mean, 15,000 members, diverse, 60% youth, um, graduates, students, specialists, retired people. I mean, that is, if you talk about diverse, you know, you can say SAISI is, except we're, we're only 22% uh, female um, associated. Um, can you remember some of the challenges you know that you faced in terms of inclusive leadership, um, maybe like unconscious bias, ageism, and then how you transcended some of those? That's a difficult question. I mean, my tenure as as president of SICE was for me very exciting. Mm. I tried to steer away from those type of engagements, and 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 throughout my my tenure, all the travels we did, 
we engage largely with the younger people. Uh, the intention obviously of that year was to encourage guys to be excited about engineering. Talk about the African culture of engineering and how different it is from international. Everyone wants to be international, but we as a third world country create an environment and an infrastructure that's new, mm. it's groundbreaking. It's not just about maintenance, we're doing capital new infrastructure. So for a young engineer to be in this environment in this country is exciting. Mm. But I, th I think the biases have always been a challenge. I think, you know, if you look at SICE, and, and SICE is a success story uh, in itself. Tell the first more. black female CEO. <laughs> I mean, that is incredible. Uh, but it, when I joined SICE 22, 23 years ago, uh, I was one of the few Indian guys there. But SICE is completely transformed. I was at the CISA in Dharma the other day, and I see that CISA is also largely transformed. So I, I think the biases is something that will change over time. Yeah. Um, as the younger generation come in, as new people come in, I don't think you can eliminate the bias completely. Mm. It has always been a relay. But I think change comes through time and generations and growth. So. I agree. I agree. Because also when you try and force change, um, as engineers, we're not necessarily people who love change. You know, we're very resistant to it. And the older you get, the more difficult it is. Exactly. I, I mean, I, I'm very stubborn sometimes. <laughs> and and I, I said to myself, oh, the, my children teach me, and they say, Dad, think about my perspective. And I was like, no. And I was like, okay, <laughs> let's step back a bit. So I, I think it's a combination of things. Uh, and, and age definitely plays a part. In yeah. It. Do you think um, within the construction industry, maybe this new way of thinking, especially for the, I don't want to say older generation, maybe over 40s, because we weren't necessarily brought up in this kind of environment where our parents were inclusive in the way that they parented us and actually listened, you know. My dad used to say, children are there to be seen, not heard, <laughs> um, you know. Um, do you think we would need to bring in some form of special training to be able to harness the skill? No, I, I, think, I think we've got enough within industry and within voluntary associations like SICE and I go back to SICE because I, I feel SICE has a major role to play. So, so I think we've got enough platforms and enough information to actually do this and, and, and I go back to my point that yes we need to still work on it. I think there needs to be more uh, cultural diversity workshops, integration uh, you know, and, and SICE needs to take the lead in that. Mm. I think when it comes to professionalism and diversity and inclusivity, inclusivity and all these mm. things. For me, an organization like SICE is critical. I, you know, I, I constantly hear this thing, what, what, what's the value proposition of SICE? Yeah, yeah. That is it. Yeah. That is it, to highlight the challenges we face and to create platforms for inclusive, inclusivity and all these things. Um, so I think you guys do a good job. Um, I think there needs to be more of these kind of mm. things. Um, but I think within the organizations, you know, as you know, the old, transition out and the new transition in, there needs to be this uh, maybe some kind of structure or initiative to help the younger guys grow a little bit quicker. Because mm -hmm. the growth, if you look at your demographic and, and the size of membership, there's a gap. Yeah, there is. So the question is how do you then get those guys in that gap to bridge the gap, so yeah, to speak. So, so I think it's yeah. important, yeah. And in closing, um, I'm just interested in your leadership philosophy. Like what, what drives you as a leader? What are your um, you know, core values? In, in the beginning we were talking around family. I'm, I'm just interested in how that has shaped you know, the leader that you are currently and that you've been previously as well. So I get criticized a lot, right? Is it? Absolutely. <laughs> from my management team, from, <laughs> from a lot of people in that. I, I, I'm a very soft leader. Oh, is it? Yeah, I love it. I, 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 I don't like confrontation, but I feel for people more than I should, and that's the criticism that I've had. Um, you know, and, and but so my leadership style is very much um, understand people's background. It's about people, uh, empowering people to achieve success. That that is our culture. That's our slogan. That's our vision. Um, as a service delivery entity, you've got to focus on the people. So I, I think my leadership style is is largely to listen. Empathetic, I engage, I understand people's backgrounds. I, you know, most of my staff, I know their children, even down to the mm. tea lady. Mm. I know her children. She bought a new house, invited me to a house, we attended the housewarming. I'm that kind of person. I like to know the people, engage with them, but that from a management style creates conflict also because when you have to make hard decisions, 
it's difficult to make those hard decisions. But I think we've got an incredible board mm. and they keep me on my toes and in check. <laughs> so that softer side sometimes. So my leadership style is, is yeah, I think very much inclusive mm. and very diverse. When I make decisions, I like everybody to be part of that. Um, it takes time, it's frustrating. Decision making is sometimes slow in that process, but then you've got inclusivity and buy-in from everyone. So that's largely my management style. Yo, you're giving me so much. <sighs> yeah, because that is like if if i look at myself as a female leader i think that would be my superpower and you're giving me almost a sense of it's okay it's okay to be who you are and the way that you've been created and that is the value that you bring to the industry you know i'm going to say something bold here right? mm. i think what this industry needs right now is more female ceos we are in that place now where we need people to care a little bit it's not just about the bottom line and driving yeah. profitability. It's important. It's easy for us to say because we're doing okay. But we need somebody to have a softer approach to things, to understand people a little bit more. And I think, uh, I'll probably get shot for this one, I mustn't say it. You know, <laughs> I, I, I think women bring a different dynamic to a company, especially in a leadership role. And I'll give you examples. Right? I look at Logashi, the CEO of, of Shmoki. I look at Malini Padiachi, the yes. CEO of MPMO. I draw a lot of inspiration from the talk. Yeah. Uh, so that engagement also helps me maybe to be a little bit softer in my approach. I think I think it's who you are. I think it's naturally who you are and that is why you espouse the values that you do and you can be able to bring that into your team and into your company wherever you go as a leader. I'm I've really loved, you know, having this conversation with you, Sindrin. I wish you and Nadity much success and I know like uh, you're doing really great things um, within the industry. I mean, to be able to sustain a transformation company for over 25 years, to be this company of excellence and well-known and a leader in engineering, is not a small feat. So thank you very much for joining us today. Um, that is that is it as we wrap up with Sundra Naika, CEO of Nyeleti. <laughs>